Hi, uh, welcome everyone. I am Ken McLeod. I'm the policy director for the League of American Bicyclists. Um, thank you for joining us here today in this webinar about adapting streets to COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> this has been a really interesting topic to follow, um, a topic that continues to change over time, um, and I'm sure this won't be in any way uh, a sort of definitive webinar about this topic. Um, we're very excited to bring you stories from advocates for biking and walking today um, and how they've been involved in these efforts to reshape our streets to provide more space for people to bike and walk um, in this time when we have less traffic and we need more space for people on bike, biking and walking um, to provide that social distance and physical distance that's needed for safety. Um, so first I want to start by saying that Starting tomorrow, May is still Bike Month, so the League of American Bicyclists encourages you to celebrate Bike Month, uh, go for that solo ride, take a photo, um, share with our hashtag Bikes Unite. Um, we have the National Bike Challenge starting, so you can log your miles and compete and celebrate other people throughout the country who are biking. Um, we've got some great educational videos if you're new to biking or if you know people new to biking who might wanna learn safe bicycling techniques, um, or if you just wanna brush up on those skills. Um, and then we, we encourage everyone to do uh, like we are doing here today, connecting with uh, league member, state and local advocacy groups, uh, bike clubs, bike shops, um, you know, connect with the advocacy community, connect with the bicycle community, do it virtually, do it safely, um, do it at that, uh, safe social and physical distance. Um, so I'm very excited about our three speakers today, and I'd like to introduce you to them now. Um, we are joined by Randy Lobasso at, from the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia, Dave Campbell from Bike East Bay, and Karen Yakos from Local Motion in Burlington, Vermont. Um, they're going to be talking about their stories and their communities about how they have been involved in adapting streets to COVID-19, um, whether that is through slow streets, whether that, whether that is through closing select streets, or whether that is closing parking to provide places for biking and walking. Um, so I'm very excited to hand it off to them. If you have questions throughout this presentation, please use the chat feature to uh, ask those questions and then we will address them at the end. Um, so please don't be shy in asking those questions so we can get those answers to you. Um, and with that, I, I'd like to welcome Randy to start his presentation. Whoops, uh, sorry, technical difficulties real quick. Let me just... Okay, um, so, hey everyone, sorry about that. My name is Randy Labasso. I am the uh, policy director at the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, about five miles of streets that we were able to get closed very early on in the, uh, during the pandemic and, um, and how that has worked out for Philadelphia. And also um, what we've tried to do um, with limited success since then. So um, I'm gonna start back in, uh, in March. So uh, the city of Philadelphia um, issued our stay in place uh, uh, guidelines in um, I guess the week of March 16th. Um, so you know, we were expected to have our St. Patrick's Day parade, um, but of course there was a, there's a long history of that, which is that during the 1918 pandemic, uh, Philadelphia hosted a St. Patrick's Day parade and um, then was the most infected city in the country. And um, they wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. So we closed everything down uh, that week. Um, on St. Patrick's Day itself, um, we were still encouraged to go outside as long as we were able to maintain uh, social distance from each other, six feet, as we all know. Um, on St. Patrick's Day itself, uh, I decided to go for a bike ride, um, as one does, and um, I went out to uh, the Schuylkill River Trail. So um, for those who are not familiar with um, 
Philadelphia. Um, we have the Schuylkill River and the Delaware River sort of um, ring the city. And um, on either side of the Schuylkill River um, are, are trails that are very well used. Um, one side is Kelly Drive, the other is Martin Luther King Drive. And so um, I went out to Kelly Drive and, um, and I you know, was riding my bike and it was just completely packed with people. No one was maintaining the six feet. Um, no, everyone, people were, you know, next to each other. And there was really, it wasn't anyone's fault in particular. It was just, there was just no room to, to get by without um, being very close to each other. So um, I got off the trail as soon as I could. And um, I, I decided to uh, email some contacts in the city and uh, just figure out what they had planned on doing about this because this was, uh, this was not a good situation, uh, potentially really harmful. Um, so we, they said they, had not, they didn't really have a plan yet. So um, we decided to uh, make the case on our website and, um, and through other communications uh, that th they should start closing down some streets. Um, we also reached out to uh, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, which, um, which does counts of trails and streets throughout the city, and asked them if they noticed any um, changes between uh, the first two weeks of March this year and the first two weeks of March last year. And um, just, you know, that was more, more so just to make sure what I saw on my bike ride was not um, an anomaly. You know, it was this, that things were actually changing and because uh, people needed to get outside and weren't able to always do so, uh, were they actually um, using the trails more? So um, in this slide, you can see on the right, uh, the, uh, the impact was huge. Um, part of this was because of trying to maintain social distance. Um, the other part of it was that We've just been having a um, very warm spring this year. So, um, so we we use this information to prove our case to say that um, this this is already happening uh, by by April, May, June. This is going to get even worse. And um, and so we started a um, a petition that we got um, within 24 hours. We got. Um, over a, over a thousand people signed and people wrote notes saying that this was the right thing to do um, to actually close Martin Luther King Drive. So um, I guess to back up a second, Martin Luther King Drive um, is often closed. It's, uh, it's uh, during um, regattas and also um, on weekends between April and October, the city closes uh, the street for um recreational activity um it's a four-lane road it's huge uh it's used really um during the week as a uh sort of um like an expressway to get into the city sort of like a secret passageway that um that people who uh who don't want to use the highway use to get in and it's really you know it's it's not a safe road by any means but when they close it it's great um so uh, we asked the city to close it uh, for good, 24 hours a day, um, given that they already had the uh, infrastructure to do so. Um, right here, you can see uh, the, there are gates um, on Martin Luther King Drive. Uh, what you're seeing right there is uh, where the drive uh, runs into the part of the city with um, where the art museum is, the famous uh, steps from Rocky. and um, and so it really spans a pretty big portion of the city. But um, so I, like I said earlier, March 17th, we, uh, I went on that bike ride. By March 20th, which was a Friday, uh, the city agreed to close Martin Luther King Drive for good. Um, it was, uh, at the time, very exciting because this was something that we all felt we needed. And um, we started uh, trying to do more. Um, what you can see right there is uh, just people using the drive. Um, these three people in front are on Martin Luther King Drive. Behind them are uh, people on the Schuylkill River Trail, which as you can see is much smaller. It's only about a 12 foot wide path. 
So um, it was really desperately needed. <clears throat> Now, um, since then, we've uh, we've been working to do more. Um, we've been, well, with like I said earlier, varying success. Um, we after we uh, used our own, just our own petition and uh, and advocacy chops to get that road closed. Um, we joined with some other organizations around the city, uh, called community organizations and advocacy organizations to make the case to close more streets and um, we we basically uh, looked at streets like MLK Drive that uh, were near parks and sen since uh, parks were getting over overflowed and um, and a lot of people were uh, were using them and still driving in them all a lot of parks in Philadelphia have uh, roads through them that people speed on because they're not really um, you know, there's not much enforcement in there. Um, and uh, we just asked, you know, maybe you can close those as well and uh, the streets around them. And uh, we ended up getting about a third of our city council on board with that as well and sent a joint letter from all our organizations to the administration. Um, the administration has not been, um, has not been really complying with, uh, with any of what we've asked for since then. Um, they uh mlk drive was the easy one because we had um we had the built-in infrastructure to close it um everything else is they they're worried um about you know uh potentially police presence uh putting up barricades and um just maintaining them um so uh it's been really difficult so far which is why i'm glad i'm on a uh, webinar with someone uh with others uh, who've, who've successfully done this. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, the three main points um, that I would say about getting particular streets closed completely is, um, you know, you notice the problem and uh, we came up with a solution for the city. Um, we found a way to prove the case uh, to, to allow them to do that. And then um, we basically gave the city uh, an option with um, very minimal, on their part, minimal resistance, uh, because this was something that um, we were, they were already doing on weekends. Um, it was just basically doing it forever uh, or for the time being. Um, we're now you know, trying to move toward a slow streets campaign, uh, a temporary protected bike lane campaign for commuters in the post COVID world. Um, and uh, all of that is sort of in flux right now and uh, is really changing by the day. So, um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's sort of what we did there. Thanks, Andy. I, I really like how, how quickly you were able to jump on um, the kind of opportunity you saw there. Um, just wanna ask a, a quick question from the, the audience, um, kind of about the context of MLK Drive. Um, did closing it affect businesses or public transit? Are there routes or businesses located along the drive? Uh, no, uh, MLK Drive goes through Fairmount Park, so it connects to neighborhoods, uh, but there are no businesses along the drive. Um, I, we don't, I don't have the best picture here, but um, if you'll see in this photo, on one side of the drive is uh, Montgomery Avenue, which brings you to another part of Fairmount Park. Fairmount Park, by the way, is massive. It's a huge park in Philadelphia. And on the other side is the Schuylkill River. So it's really just a, um, uh, through the park, uh, you don't really get to business until you're on um, either side of, of Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King Drive. So like in this picture, you get into a business area when you go past those gates. Um, so it didn't affect any businesses. Um, that's why, I mean, like I was saying, it's, it was very low hanging fruit for us. Um, and it's probably why we were able to get it done so quickly. Um, but it's had a really positive impact on um, on people who need to get out of their house um, and and people who are uh, traveling uh, greater distances than they usually would for especially for like food delivery services. Okay, um, and and maybe somewhat related. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of parkland, but you said it connects to some neighborhoods. Um, what's the ethnic makeup of those areas? Um, like what, what types of neighborhoods are connected? 
Um, so it uh, really varies about which part of the drive um, you're coming off of. Uh, so let's see here. So um, right here is a uh, mostly African-American community. As you go further um, west, it becomes uh, more mixed. Uh, but uh, those communities were spoken to before this happened. And um, the council member in the area was also reached out to their communities. And, um, and people in general were on board. And there hasn't been any, um, any negativity coming from those communities since then. Great. And great to hear that outreach was there. Um, so I see some questions about slow streets. Um, so I think maybe that's a great transition to our next panelist, uh, Dave Campbell uh, with Bike East Bay. I'm going to hand over the presentation to him now. And, and thank you again, Randy, for that great presentation. Um, and, and I'm sure there'll be some more questions as, as we circle around after Dave and Karen's presentations. Thanks, Ken. Dave Campbell, Advocacy Director with Bike East Bay. Uh, our large city is Oakland, California, just to the right of San Francisco. And Oakland has implemented a uh, 74, or is in the process of implementing a 74 mile slow streets program. You're looking at a photo here. It's actually a New York Times photo. I included it, one, because it's a good photo, and two, as soon as Oakland announced there are 74 miles of neighborhood slow streets. It got picked up by the national press. And this gives you an idea of what 42nd Street in North Oakland looks like on any given day or even any given week and now. And, and the 42nd Street slow street has been very successful. Well, let's take a look at what the plan is here in Oakland. Uh, we started this on April 11th. And you're looking at Oakland's slow street map as it currently exists now. We have, if you count them up, you'll see there's eight in purple slow streets that are on the ground. They've been on the ground for two, three, four weeks. The yellow are streets that are gonna become slow streets either this weekend or the following weekend. And then the gray, you'll see some gray lines there those are candidate for future slow streets that get rolled out. And in Oakland, the plan is to do five miles of slow streets every week. And so we've done two sets of five miles. We're gonna do another five set of streets this weekend, another five miles the following weekend. That'll get us up to 20 miles of slow streets. And these are all neighborhood streets. None of them are commercial corridors. They don't have transit on them. And they're also not near any uh like critical health facilities hospitals for example and the one other color you see here in kind of this fuchsia red is oakland's program has been successful enough that the city of emeryville to the north has started a slow street on doyle street and the city of alameda kind of to the southwest uh, just started yesterday or actually today is is the official first day of uh, their first two slow streets. And I'll show you some photos of those later. And then I didn't show you, but on the map to the left is San Francisco across the water. And they also started a slow street program uh, working with Walk SF, San Francisco Bike Coalition. And I think they've done two streets to date and they're gonna be rolling out some more as well. So this is the, the state of uh, our slow streets today. I included here also, you see, uh, uh, a screen capture of Mayor Libby Schaff in the upper right. I hope you can see that on my screen. It's, it's blocked a little bit. And so when Oakland announced their slow street program, the mayor had a press conference and you can see her there. And, uh, and if anyone's on the call from New York City, you may recognize Ryan Russo in the background there, the Oakland Department of Transportation Director. He was at the press conference as well. And I included this screenshot of the mayor because our program has been as successful as it's been because of her strong leadership. She wants this to happen. She wants it to happen faster, more streets, and, and keep it going. And that's made all the difference in the world. 
uh, her strong leadership. Uh, thank the mayor for that. Uh, the where Oakland got the idea of doing this was from its existing bicycle plan. And this is a map from the bicycle plan that shows neighborhood boulevards. This isn't the whole plan. This is just the neighborhood boulevard part of the plan. And these purple lines, solid lines, dashed lines are all potential neighborhood boulevards, slow streets, calm streets that don't have through traffic, that have low traffic volumes. And Oakland pulled this, pulled from this to do their slow streets program. And so the, the idea is that any street on this map shown in purple can become a slow street. Save a few streets that are, there's a couple on here that are transit streets, those have been removed. There's a couple near hospitals, those have been removed as well. But this is the basis for the, the program. This uh, bike plan was just adopted last year in Oakland and it went through a lot of public outreach. Uh, the city actually paid community groups to do the outreach and it was quite extensive. Oakland, I believe, just won an award, perhaps a national award for their bike plan. So there was a lot of input into this. And so the mayor and OakDOT felt there was there was some public input and basis for doing the slow street program to move forward with it. And I say that because there was no opportunity to do public outreach uh, during shelter in place to launch the program. Here's some photos from it. You'll see in the lower right, the Oakland crews went out the first day and put these semi half street barricades up, essentially two A-frames. The streets closed to through traffic, a pedestrian sign, two cones. And then at the, the at the next arterial street, the same thing is coming in the opposite direction. So the idea is that cars can go around this if they're local traffic, but if they're through traffic, they're discouraged from using the street. And uh, and so you're seeing just a couple examples here. The the big shot to the left I like because in this neighborhood they needed these barricades to block off this cul-de-sac that you're looking at. So they took the signs from Plymouth and moved it over to the cul-de-sac where the kids were playing more. And it's a nice example of a neighborhood adaptation of what the city did to actually make this street a little bit safer. And so how did, I just wanna say a few, bit, few words about how we got to this point. When shelter in place happened in the Bay Area, I think it was around March 16th or 17th, a lot of advocates got together to address several issues. One, our regional parks and our shorelines were starting to close down and close off access because of the crowding issues, similar to the ones that Randy talked about. And there was a lot more speeding on the streets because there was less traffic on the streets. And it, it was really quite horrific how some drivers took the shelter in place and the decreased traffic volumes as an opportunity to speed. And, and more people were walking and biking in their neighborhoods. And so those, those are the two motivations to try to get Oakland in particular, uh, Berkeley as well, the city to the north, to do some safety improvements. We asked for things like the pedestrian beg buttons to be put on recall, uh, turn some traffic lights to flashing red to slow traffic down, widen some sidewalks with cones, uh, traffic calming as well. And the initial response from Oak Dot was, we really can't do a lot of that stuff. And the advocates weren't quite satisfied with that. And so we got back in touch with Oak Dot and they by then had come up with this idea of 74 miles of slow streets based on the bicycle plan. And we were excited to hear that because that addressed really two, the two main concerns we had about speeding traffic and uh, being able to stretch your legs in your neighborhood. And mind you, it, do, it certainly doesn't solve speeding traffic everywhere, but it, it was meant to be a start. Uh, so we, we got together with Oak Dot to try to put together what this plan was, would look like. And what ended up happening is the mayor announced the program literally two days later saying it was going to start that Saturday. And that was a surprise to us. We were not, we didn't realize that the mayor was going to make the announcement and we didn't know the program would start two days later. We thought the advocates thought it would take more time for the city to get this program together and to get, for example, police and fire on board to talk to the health department, make sure it was okay, et cetera. And, but it got announced and it started that Saturday. 
And so we were, the advocates were scrambling. The city was even scrambling some to make this program happen. They happen to have enough of these signs in-house to deploy them, but they've since, as they roll out this program, they're having to hire a traffic management company. I think you can even see their phone number there to put up some of these barricades uh, for the city. And it's been successful in Oakland, although I'll say a few words about where and how it has not been successful, but we've had several streets that the neighbors really took to, and it did inspire a couple other cities to do the slow streets. And I showed you those slow streets in Fuchsia Red earlier. To the left here is Doyle Street in Emeryville. It was a street that's meant to be a neighborhood boulevard, and the city had plans to close a block off and to calm it already. And it was kind of in the works. It was probably still six months to a year away, if I had to guess. And the city council took it upon themselves to, to slow this street for purposes of COVID response. And so they put up a bunch of, you know, these, these water filled, I don't know if you call them K-rail, but these barriers and actually closed off a full block as well as putting these barriers up so you could walk and bike behind them. So that's Doyle Street in Emeryville. To the right is the city of Alameda. They just launched their program today and they've got some nice new signage that they're putting up and the kids are already out enjoying it. So we have three cities in the East Bay that are doing slow streets. We're still pushing for Berkeley to do it. Our most bike friendly city has been probably the most resistant to doing it. Uh, there's still some conventional thinking in Berkeley for sure. And this slide I wanted, I wanted to share with you because for Oakland to do 74 miles of slow streets, they're gonna need neighborhood support. They're gonna need lots of neighborhood help and volunteer help. And the idea originally was is to let neighbors close off streets that are on the Purple Bike Boulevard network on their own, uh, just kind of to add to the program. But Oakland decided they didn't wanna do that. I think the attorney's office called the mayor's offices and said, that's not a good idea. That doesn't mean the neighbors didn't think it was a good idea. They still thought it was a good idea. So they, they went ahead and did it. And the city is not sanctioning this, but they're also not ticketing anybody. There's no enforcement on this program. So you have some examples here. Of, here's the Laurel Village Association. Did some decorative wheels and some cones and put it out there, put up some signs. Another neighbor here in the lower middle took his or her trash can, put it out there with a no through traffic sign. And then one of the nicer examples is this block with the tweet captures here. Uh, the neighbors, this was a slow street. It had been implemented by the city with the half closures and they went ahead and closed the whole street, put up some decorative stuff and the kids were playing in it and they had some parents out making sure the traffic didn't use the street or if it was a local neighbor who needed to get to their driveway they could and and so as a set of examples of neighbors taking the program to another level uh, which i think is very exciting good to see uh, and a few words about the the signage here is the oakland sign that we've been putting up uh, volunteers actually made this sign the city didn't do it uh, walk oakland bike oakland made this sign but volunteers were helping to tape these signs to the back of the barricades you can see some volunteers there doing that and uh, every saturday at noon the volunteers get together at city hall you can see us gathering there a couple weeks ago and we distribute the flyers to volunteers who go out and tape these flyers on the back of the a-frames that the city puts up the night before and we go back to the ones that were already up and replace signs that are missing and we're also adding these signs to poles in the middle of the block just to get the word out to the neighbors what this is how they can provide input to the city they can use the 311 system that the city uses for all sorts of feedback to report issues uh, to give feedback on the slow streets program there's a survey there's a tiny url link to a survey where people can provide feedback or they also get to vote on the next set of streets that they'd like to see added to the program and then we all hopped on our bikes and went and put these signs up. Uh, and then a few words about what's not working. Uh, honestly, we've got eight streets on the ground in 
Oakland, and about half of them are working pretty well. A couple of them are working really well. The, the photo from the New York Times is a good example of that. But three or four of the streets are, you know, they're like they always are. And, you know, the, you don't see a lot of people out on those streets. You're seeing some photos here of Plymouth and uh, Brookdale. Uh, East 16th Street is another one. And uh, these streets, they're in largely Latino, African-American neighborhoods. And the, the neighbors are either doing what they normally do on the street. They may be in their front yard. They may be on their porch. They may be walking. They may be working on their cars on the street. But you don't see any additional activity that uh, you see on the other streets, and and, and part of, part part of that is we're we're trying to better understand how people use streets in different neighborhoods, and it's difficult to do during shelter in place because you can't really do a lot of meaningful input at this time. You can put up flyers, you know, you can sort of leave flyers. Uh, we are working with block monitors or block ambassadors who live on these streets to help spread the word uh, and let people provide feedback and to better understand what's going on. But, you know, it's still a work in progress how to make these slow streets work for everyone. And, and one thing we're learning is some neighborhoods just use their streets and think about their streets differently than other neighborhoods. And for sure, the, the more affluent neighborhoods uh, are taking to the slow streets program better. So we have more work to do. It's a challenge when in shelter in place, it, it's tougher to do that work. And in Oakland, everyone admits and we apologize. Uh, the mayor's office has apologized openly that the program was launched before much outreach could happen. And I think just for that reason, uh, people who might otherwise think it's a good program or should be improved or expanded you know, are, are, are turned off by it and not as supportive as they could be. And so that's probably one lesson to other cities that are thinking of doing this is, you know, I would spend at least a week or, or, or so making some phone calls to key local stakeholders to let them know this idea is in the works and you get some feedback uh, before it actually gets launched. Uh, definitely a lesson learned here in Oakland. That's it, Ken. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, just one quick question uh, as I hand it over to Karen. Are, are those um, barriers up 24 seven, the, the ones put out by the yep. city? Yep, Okay. yeah, and the city goes around now once a week or maybe even a little more regularly with their crews to replace the ones that get damaged or run over. All right, great. Um, and I'm. I'm sure again there will be more questions for you at the end, uh, but want to make sure that we're we're getting to Karen and giving her plenty of time. Um, so excited to have you join us, Karen. Hi there, this is Karen Yakos. I'm from Locomotion. Uh, we're a Vermont-based um, statewide organization that advocates we're advocates for biking and walking. I'm calling you from uh, Waterbury, um, Vermont, which is in our minds the capital of of mountain biking in the state. So if you ever anyone asks, just say it's our town. We're trying to compete for that. Um, I want to um, thank the league for doing this. It's been super helpful to for us to see ideas from elsewhere. And I'm going to try to provide um, some solutions that are from Vermont. So this is a Vermont style, um, both on the street side of things, but also um, we've got I've got some other things that are going to help businesses, we think, um, at the end that are related to this. So um, this is Burlington. For those of you that don't know it, it's a small city. So I wanted you to see what small cities can do. It's about 43,000 people. Um, the whole state is around 600,000. So we're the largest city in the state, the economic and cultural center of Vermont. I kind of think of it as a mini Seattle, maybe in terms of topography. It's got a lot of pitch to it. Ends up at water. Um, the streets run down into that area, and along that um, is a bike path that runs along the city um, all the way north. It's also the gateway to Lake Champlain, um, and it's got a waterfront park that we're pretty proud of. And I'm mentioning all this because it's germane to the, the solutions that we've been um, coming up with. We also have Church Street, which is um, a very important um, uh, open street for the city. It's been like that for as long as I've been here. I went to college here, which was a while ago, um, and it is a vibrant place, not at the moment, but it typically is. 
Um, and biking is becoming a form of transportation here that's growing. Um, even though we get pretty harsh winters, sometimes people, because of the gear you can get now, are making it work, which is really great. Like a lot of small cities, though, it's limited in terms of its resources and the things that we can do, but we consider ourselves um, pretty, pretty mighty for being small. So when I'm going to talk about in terms of closing roads and things like that, it's an impact. It's a good impact for us when I compare it to things like 74 miles of slow streets or in closing off whole, whole roads, which is possible in Philly and Oakland. You know, if we did that, we are we would have no we don't we don't have those roads. So we had to be creative differently here. So this is our story. And maybe I'll be able to advance this. Um, I want to mention just for a minute, because it's germane to our story, that the Greenway, the Lake, Sh the the um, the Island Line um, rail trail runs through the city. It's the Greenway through the city. It runs also up into the islands, which is what you can see on there on the right. Um, locomotion operates a, a bike ferry across that, and I'm mentioning this because this was part of a perfect storm that came together that made it possible for us to do what we've done in Burlington, and also it's a plug for Burlington. Um, when, the, when this whole COVID thing is behind us, we want all of you to come and visit us and bike on this because we're going to need you to come here and help us. Um, this is, the like all of you, you know, there was an announcement early on when COVID came here that we were going to be um, staying at home. And so the, the governor for the state um, made that um, uh, call early on. We were one of the, we were an early city to close. Uh, early state to close actually. Um, we're closed through May or through the middle, middle part of May. And like places around the world really, we've, um, people just found, had to find places to recreate. And so they came out and they did that. And like you've heard before, we started to see that happening everywhere, but it was kind of Vermont style. So walking all over the streets, filling up the bike lanes um, with biking and walking. Um, yes, that's a, a, a skateboard, wind surfing device that somebody uses to commute. So that was our, our story as well. Um, and the roadways now had newer bikers on them, people that weren't normally um, biking. And so maybe they weren't quite as skilled as some of the folks that do it all the time. So we knew we needed to find a safe solution um, for the city. Um, and by when I, when I say we, I mean our organization, all the advocates and the leadership of the city, it really is evident that something needed to happen. The city was thinking about what could be done to add more space to take care of the congestion that was coming on the roads. Um, at the same time, Local Motion was already working with some of our advocate partners. So the Burlington Walk Bike Council, which is a close partner of ours that focuses specifically on Burlington, we were already in, having talks with the city about making Pine Street, which is a major north-south corridor coming into the city, um, a safe place as a detour. So that bike path I mentioned earlier that runs along the water and through the city um, was under reconstruction and that reconstruction has been delayed for the entire summer. So um, we were looking for a place to get people uh, out uh, through the town and it was going to be Pine Street and we were concerned that with those new riders on the road and more of them that would be a, a bit of an issue. Um, so we were talking to the city about that um, and we were trying to talk, we were talking to them about maybe removing some parking. So this is Pine Street, not when it's super busy, but you can see there's a fair amount of parking on it. There's some bike lanes. There's a lot of sharrows. Um, during, during normal rush hours, which is pretty good part of the morning and the afternoon, and actually pretty much all day, this road is just packed with um, cars. It's a, it's a employment center, it's the brew pub area, it's some awesome um, restaurants and cafes, so it's pretty popular. With COVID-19, um, was, this was becoming more of a place that people were trying to get through town. So there were more pressure on this, more people on the sidewalks. And, all, with, the, and with less parking, um, it was easier for us to think about maybe removing some parking along this. Also, transit in our city and others um, was down with COVID quite a bit. So ridership was down, the schedules were down, and there are a lot of people in Burlington that rely on, on transit to get around. So we're kind of looking for other um, ways to get around in a safe place to be on a bike seemed like that. So it was a bit of a perfect storm, as I mentioned. Um, 
already looking at this corridor for other reasons. The city, the mayor, Department of Public Works, all thinking about solutions. So the mayor and DPW announced uh, removing parking along the north side of this and putting in a temporary bike lane. So yay, we were pretty excited about that. However, um, as you all know, when you remove parking, um, you get you can get a pretty terrifying situation. This is when there's no cars on the road. Uh, we noticed that people were driving faster on the road because it looks like a runway, and we got concerned about that. Um, there was a sense of it being open, and that didn't help. And with the cars gone, there's this also there's a certain amount of protection that actually comes. It slows slows cars down. It makes people more wary of looking around. Maybe they notice bikers uh, more often. So we were beginning to have a dialogue with the city, um, asking for protection along this route. And that would be cones and barrels, something temporary to make that um, temporary structure um, work. And again, we were helping to organize the advocacy voice with our partners from the city. Um, I got to say, it helps to have a really good relationship with your Department of Public Works and your mayor, um, because we were able to work in partnership with them on this. We, we are lucky as an organization to have that relationship in Burlington. There's a lot of trust there, and it really came into play here. So we. Um, uh, we know that the city is overloaded. We know that they can't do a whole lot. Like you're hearing in a lot of cities, it's just too much for the departments to, to go out and do things. So we said, hey, we'll help out. We have a pop-up trailer that can put, um, we, we have cones that we can put out and there's other things that we can do. And so we um, volunteered to, to basically do that. So the city um, put up cones for us. We have cones, of the pop-up trailers in upper left. We have a bunch of cones that we said we would put out Turns out our cones were not as substantial as theirs and they found some they could use, they put them out. They needed somebody to take care of them because they can tip over. So we have, uh, we're good at getting volunteers out. We have a mess, we have a lot of volunteers at Locomotion. And so we were able to very quickly um, mobilize those people. We put them up on an app within uh, 24 hours. We had filled all 88 slots for this period of time that we're looking at right now through the middle part of May. And uh, that's to come out and basically put the cones back up, put them in the right place, um, put the signs back up if they get tipped over, and do it twice a day. So I think that was a really helpful thing that we were able to do for the city. Um, and they were able to come back in and put in some more um, like barrels and things like that to make it all safer. So, you know, really kind of working well. I don't have um, any other pictures in this one right now because I'm sort of sequestered out where I am, but somebody sent this one in, but it seems to be working really well. The other thing the city did, like you had just heard from Oakland, is that we put up, um, the city um, closed off some roads. So we have a, also have a bike walk plan for the city, which is all blurry on the right there. Um, and um, using that as a guide, and that's not the plan. This is the, actually the plan has a lot of these on it, but this is the, the, the ones that they focused on for COVID. Um, they were able to put up signs to close off those roads. They basically tell you to sort of, uh, up, you know, this, is, this road is closed, not for you. Um, we are hopeful that actually we're not gonna push this because it's, it's not really our role, but we are hopeful that the people who live on these roads do some of the creative things that you saw in some of the other pictures where they put up flower pots and, and umbrellas and lawn chairs or whatever it takes to keep their, their families safe on these roads. Um, we also um, have the city putting up uh, what we're calling shared streets. It's basically just signs. We're not changing, they're not changing the infrastructure on those streets, but they're basically telling people to watch for pedestrians and cyclists. So there's a lot of that going around, on around the city. Um, we're doing our best to work with them on things that we can help with and also to get the word out to um, folks. Um, what's next? So that's what has happened so far. All of that was implemented pretty quickly. Uh, I got to say, when there's a pandemic facing, staring you down, it's amazing what can get done. Mind you, it's temporary, but we hope that it actually changed pe changes people's minds about things. So the other part of what we're working on is that here's Church Street on the left during normal times in the summer. Here's what it looks like on the right now. Um, you can see a lot of places where restaurants are out, where you can sit outside. Um, those are very vibrant restaurants. That happens on, um, to a lesser degree on the road, but it, there are lots of restaurants on the rest of the town as well. 
And so what we are looking at is a, is a community that loves to congregate and they aren't gonna have the ability to do that anytime soon. We know that the, the restrictions are gonna lift very slowly. People are gonna be hesitant to go out and feel safe on sidewalks and in downtowns. Um, and businesses are gonna suffer because of that. They have to have their own social distancing. People have to eat far apart from each other. So we've been looking at how we can help. So I wanted to pass this along as an idea for those of you in cities that can manage this. Um, some cities are opening up their downtowns. Now we have an open street downtown already, but we also last summer, the city of Burlington um, tested out some uh, pilot, uh, did, did a couple of pilots of parklets. And so this is when you take over a parking spot and you make it available to the establishment that's there, usually a restaurant. Typically the restaurant pays for this and, and they have to pay for the loss of parking, at least in Burlington, that's the guidance. We think it's a great program. Um, we think, and the one on the left, by the way, is LA, just because I didn't have any more pictures from Burlington. There were only two pilots, but this is a pretty good representation of it. Um, we are asking the city to consider doing something like this, and we're actually asking the whole state, any town that has um, anything that they can do, why not? Let's help our businesses out a little bit here, give them a little more space to, to practice their social distancing, because they're gonna suffer. And they're a really big part of Main Street and what makes our communities vibrant in Vermont and probably everywhere that you all are from as well. So, and it also sends a message that removing parking can be a good thing. Um, businesses can actually capture uh, all sorts of new revenue that way. And having, having bike lanes can be that too. So we're doing some work on Pine Street with the businesses there to help them support what's going on with the bike lane, uh, to start to think of bikers and, and cyclists as people that will spend money on food and beer in their places. So that's a good thing. We've also put together some guidance, which is available online. If you wanna see this, it's in our about section under the blogs. Uh, we made this available across the state to all the communities here. We worked with VTrans, our DOT, um, on, on getting that disseminated and some of the ideas are in it, but it basically guides communities on how they can do shared streets on a shoestring. It doesn't have to be fancy, it just that needs to get done. Uh, and we'll be looking for other areas to provide guidance. Maybe we'll do something on parklets if that starts to catch on here. But, but so far, so good. And I think we're all in this together, as they say, and, and you're seeing some really good solutions coming out um, in Vermont and, and everywhere. So I hope that was helpful. And uh, I just want to say when you get a perfect storm of pandemic and, and detours and all the rest of it, you know, great stuff can happen. So there you go. Thank, thank you so much for sharing. It's really cool to see uh, how you were able to help the city through volunteers um, and kind of provide that support for the cones, um, kind of help that burden or help share that burden. Um, yeah. That was a big, that was a big part of, you know, if, when you have a city that's saying, man, we're maxed out too, you can imagine all the things that they're dealing with. We were able to say, hey, we got cones, we can help, we've got people, we can, <clears throat> it really makes for such a great partnership. Yeah, and, and I, I've unmuted all of our presenters so they can answer questions here. Um, I think a lot of the questions we we got were kind of related to you know, how do we get localities that are strained, that have reduced budgets to, to do this? Um, you know, what does it cost? Um, does anyone have any, any more insight about like how much it costs to say close a, a street? What's, what should we quote to a city for putting up signs? Uh, Ken, this is Dave. Uh, here it's, it's less than $20,000. It's Oak, Oak Dot just called these traffic management companies, and this is what they do. It's their businesses, and they're they're putting the cones out, they're putting the signs out, and it's it's less than twenty thousand dollars. I, I don't know that for certain, but that's generally what we've heard from Oak Dot for other sorts of events where they close streets down. It's very similar. And for a small city, I don't think it costs very much at all. Um, we, you know, they found somebody who had the cones that could put them out. The signs are nothing fancy. 
the materials they put on the street are limited and, and things that they use for other things. Um, we even talked about maybe having neighborhood kids make some of the signs if, if we couldn't find, you know, if the city couldn't find the signs. So I think you can get creative with that. Um, I've got a couple questions about kind of equity concerns around open streets, um, whether these streets are serving recreational needs versus transportation needs. Um, have any of you kind of had that conversation? It sounds like Oakland has a little bit of that going on, um, but would anyone like to expand on their experience with that? Sure, I, I can do that from, a, again, a small city perspective. So Pine Street, the street that now has the bike lane on it, um, protected, so to speak, um, is, the, is the route through the city and into the city. And so it serves everybody. Again, our topography is tough. And so this is how you get to work. This is the grocery stores. There's, there are grocery stores on both ends of that route. Um, it's pretty much your only shot at, at, at being able to bike in the city. So improving that road was kind of a no-brainer. Even the bike path itself, although people, some people, it is used for recreation, and certainly in the summer it becomes a place that people come to just be on. Um, it is also a transportation route for the city. Again, we have very limited places that are flat, and that's one of them. And so people that are trying to move around the city are going to be on that road, regardless of who they are and why they're on it. Uh, Ken, Dave from Oakland. I'll just add that it's it's still a conversation here. The slow streets we have, at least the ones that have been upgraded with some partial traffic closures, they're not a network yet. And some of them don't connect to anything other than your own neighborhood. And so are essential workers using these streets to get to work? Honestly, I don't think we know. And it is part of the conversation, but I think from my perspective, the bigger conversation is these streets simply allow you to go outside and get some fresh air, stretch your legs in your own neighborhood. Uh, and so it's more of a recreation or it's just more of a neighborhood amenity right now uh, to use and not get run over by a car going 50 miles an hour. Yeah, I want to echo okay. that too. That's important. And, and for cities like ours where we have areas that are pretty tight with, with old streets that are kind of not commuter streets, you know, they're not through streets. Um, in our north, old north end, which is where a lot of our new Americans are located, and, and they have quite a vibrant um, street scene down there, they needed more more space to be out in the streets and doing all the stuff that, that you need to be able to do when you don't have the parks open. Some of our parks have closed. So this is becoming that in a lot of the street. I think the city did a good job of equitably um, putting those resources in all the neighbors, neighborhoods around the city. And I think that's important that, that cities look at it that way. And hey, Ken, I, I'll also add, hey, this is Randy from Philly. Um, I'll also add just real quick, um, we made a, uh, a map to uh, get our city council members on board. And we intentionally looked at every single park and every single neighborhood in the city to see what was the easiest um, streets to close around those parks since the parks were getting really uh, very quickly filled up and uh, that's how we were able to get um, anyone on board in the first place but generally speaking these are um, looked at, at for uh, for recreation at this point okay um, another kind of topic on on the equitable uh, nature of these um, has there been any conversation either coming from the communities um, or from law enforcement related to um, potential for gun violence or concerns about um, immigration authorities uh, get, getting people who are using these streets? Um, anything like that you've seen in, in these uh, programs? Uh, Ken, this is Dave from Oakland. We've heard we've heard some of that feedback from residents. They they, you know, we have communities that don't trust city hall, don't trust government, haven't been treated well, and you know, they, even when they see that their street is repaved, you know, they think that's the city is now, you know, doing something, uh, you know, underhanded. 
Uh, one of our slow streets just got repaved. It's brand new pavement. The city put in speed humps to slow traffic down. And, and then there's other construction going on in the neighborhood. There's bus rapid transit getting built. There's just lots of other streets getting repaved and there's you know, construction equipment out there. And so this looks like more of that uh, in appearance to many residents. And so they just see this as, you know, the government's just doing another thing. City Hall is doing something else. And, and yeah, they worry that there'll be a police officer at every corner to enforce only local traffic, not through traffic. And, and what's that going to lead to? Uh, so we've heard those concerns. The mayor, for what it's worth, has said there will be no enforcement. And that's good and that's important for the mayor to say that, but I think many residents don't hear that or believe it. Yeah, this is Randy. Um, we've uh, we heard that very early on uh, from communities about you know the worry about having um, a police officer at every corner, which um, and we intentionally looked at uh, streets that w we felt would not need that. And um, so far, the administration uh, has pushed back, um, claiming that they would need that, which is why we're sort of in this in between situation we're in right now. Okay, um, we have a few more minutes. We are not gonna get to all of the questions and, and I'm sorry for, for that. Um, and I thank everyone for asking some really great questions. Um, I, I do wanna say that the uh, recording of this webinar will be available. You should get it, I believe, a day or two from now um, through an automated email. Um, if you don't, please contact me at ken at bikelink.org. Um, so we're just going to go through maybe two more questions for the presenters um, or see how our, our time goes. Um, so the first one that I, I want to address is whether any of you have worked with public health uh, departments or public health agencies um, on these programs or if you've received any pushback through those, from those agencies on these programs. Uh, Ken, uh, Dave with Oakland. Uh, yes, the I'll I'll say that the Oakland, the Alameda County Health Department, they support Oakland's Slow Streets program, and and that's definitely very helpful. When Walk SF tried to get Golden Gate Drive closed to cars in San Francisco before Oakland's Slow Streets program, the San Francisco Health Department said no, and the mayor supported the health department naturally. Uh, just this past week, they opened up Golden Gate Drive to bikes and peds and closed it to cars on second on second thought. So wiser heads have prevailed there as well with their health department now on board. So an example of the health department saying no and then saying yes in San Francisco. In Oakland, our health department said yes from, from the get-go and see this as an important thing as regional parks and regional destinations close down because of crowds. The health department knows that when you get outside and get fresh air and stretch your legs, you are strengthening your immune system and that's helpful. I would say that in Vermont, there's all, the Department of Health is very supportive of this kind of thing, whether the city had those conversations, I'm not sure, but I, I will say that it's helpful that, that they were following the Burlington bike walk plan, so plan BTV, um, which is something that was multi-stakeholder, went on for a couple of years and is, is a bit of the guidance for this. So I would say through that, there's support. And this is Randy. Uh, we have not um, been in contact yet, yet with our health commissioner, um, who is a member of the administration. Um, we have been working with um, uh, public health oriented uh, community organizations in the city, though, to, uh, to make the case. That's that's great. Um, and kind of keeping with working with others, uh, uh, maybe the last question is, you know, who has it been good to work with? It, is it neighborhood associations that have been really helpful to reach out to? Is it city council persons? Um, is it the mayor? Uh, as people are doing advocacy here, uh, what would you suggest in terms of outreach to uh, officials or or others?
Um, I would, uh, this is Randy. Um, we have, uh, have out of this, we've created pretty good relationships with, um, with staff members in some city council offices. Our city council in Philadelphia has, um, from what I understand, a lot more power than uh, city councils have in several other cities. And, uh, and in working with them and working with their staff and figuring out exactly which streets would work and which ones might not, we've um, created some good relationships and, um, and we're in touch a lot. And, uh, and we are uh, now working toward, um, with them uh, toward some more uh, plans going forward, you know, for, for the COVID uh, crisis and also for what the city might look like after COVID. I'd say Karen, work this with is Dave. I'll just add. Yeah, go ahead, but, Karen. Uh, work with your city leadership, and then what we can do as advocates is we can get the public voice behind those decisions. That gives them a lot of cover, and it pushes them at the same time. And that's a good way to get things done, I think. Yeah, I was just going to add the three cities we have slow streets in. It's coming from council, and you know, council is directing staff to do it. And without that, I can't imagine we would have gotten this to happen, particularly because the public health officer, you know, their advice is so important. And, but I didn't want to imply from my last answer to the last question, you know, the public health officer and the health departments have plenty to do right now. They don't want to be on the phone to a bunch of walk bike advocates, spending time figuring out are bike shops essential or how do you do open streets? So with the health department, we kind of work through elected officials who already were talking to the health department to just kind of add to that conversation hey can we do open streets and got a positive response great um well thank thank you all for uh sharing your experiences answering these questions um you know i'm sure we'll be looking to see how more cities uh kind of take lessons from uh the cities that are already doing this and how cities come out of this um, hopefully with more biking and walking. Um, we are past three, um, so I want to respect everyone's time and say thank you for attending this webinar. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to celebrate Bike Month with you starting tomorrow. Um, and thank you again to all of our presenters today, Dave, Karen, and Randy. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. Stay safe. Have a great day.